Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming here, and I'd like to thank Ikea and for you know organizing this wonderful meetup. It's been a while since we physically met, and the two years of COVID made it very difficult to do so. So I'm very glad that all of you have taken time out on a Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon as of now. And that goes on to show how enthusiastic you are all about design. So uh, we'll just start off right away. So I'd like to introduce myself first. Of course, thanks to Digvijay, he did a great job. But apart from that, I currently am a UX design lead at Frontrow. I lead a small team of designers here. And at Frontrow, what we're trying to do is uh, we are trying to build this platform which helps people pursue their passion. Uh, before this, interestingly, I was one of those engineers turned designers. So I was actually having a full-time job. I used to work as a back-end engineer in American Express and then I made a switch. Uh, when I realized that design was my true calling. Now, having said that, I love to talk about myself beyond my work, of course. So the four photos which describe me are these. So uh, you can find me on weekend cycling uh, with a bunch of camera gear on my backpack, taking occasional pauses to pet dogs in various neighborhoods, or playing football, if I'm not procrastinating that is. So having said that, we'll jump right into it. Uh, we'll talk about design systems. Well, not. We will not talk about design systems. Tanisha will talk about design systems after this. We will actually talk about great systems for design teams. Now, I know this sounds a little confusing. This might not be very descriptive. So, I will go on to explain what it means and how we came to this particular topic. So, uh, this whole talk is going to be more of a conversation between you and I, where I'll tell you more about my journey as a designer in the last couple of years that I've come to the uh, design industry as a developer first. And what were my learnings in this past two years? I like to share all of my wins, what I learned, all my failures as well. And hopefully I can make an interesting conversation when you can have some good takeaways for your design teams that you're building. So before we start, I want to give a quick disclaimer, which is that uh, if you talk about this particular topic, it's going to be more applicable if you're working in a startup rather than a big or a mid-sized company. If you already work at a mid-sized company where you have a mature design team, a lot of the practices or ideas we're going to talk about, you might know fewer. However, if you are at a startup where you're building a new team by yourself, then this topic is going to be right for you. So I'd like to talk about how we came to this idea of this topic, right? Uh, about building better systems for design teams. So this all started with a conversation that I had with my manager more than a year ago. It was one of my earlier one-on-ones and I was at a point where I was starting to realize that I, I'm reaching a stage in my career where I am trying to contribute more and my learning is slightly diminishing. And this is a point that a lot of you would reach multiple times in your career. And the obvious answer to such a question is usually a switch. You switch to a bigger team where there are bigger challenges, there's a better team, a uh, more higher scale for you to work at. But a rather unconventional choice in the certain same case is also to take the challenge of building the team that you actually want to work for in your very own organization. And at that point, I was very confused. That seemed like a very unconventional idea to me. However, I did go ahead with the latter option, which was to build the kind of team that I wish to work for. And I couldn't have been more proud. So now having said that, I'll move on to our first main uh, topic, so to say, which is ownership. Ownership, uh, the way I like to define this word, is with a and the synonym uh, of the word which would be excitement or enthusiasm. So you know when you're enthusiastic about something, when you are excited about a particular thing, you are naturally more inclined to take more control. You are naturally inclined to take more ownership. So in the same way, once we started taking a look at the way people work, mostly my design teammates, I noticed a particular pattern. It's a very simple graph if you look at your screens. This graph talks about various stages of design process and how enthusiasm of designers usually drops or climbs in that particular stage. So, for example, once you start reading the PRDs that your product managers have written, you are mildly excited about this new idea that the PM is pitching, right? But once you start making the wireframes, then you're a little more curious about, wow, this seems like an interesting feature that you can all use your design skills for. And by the time you actually jump onto Figma, when you start making those rectangles with rounded corners and those fancy gradients, you are really, really excited. That hey, I'm going to put this new interaction that I just learned. And this is going to be an amazing story. I'm going to just put my all shots on triple and I'm going to be very excited. But right after that, once you start handing off or rather even in the post handoff stage, once you start going in a stage where you have shipped the designs, but now it's time to look how will they perform. That is where we notice that the enthusiasm of people had a significant drop. People kind of treated it as their job is done. And now is the job of a PM to take care of the designs. So that is the first thing we set out to change. How do you make sure that the 
overall enthusiasm level of the designers is more consistent than a curve like this. So one of the first few approaches which worked out very well in our favor is to look at the product team slightly in a different way. So on the left, you would see that there's a bunch of drawers. On the right, there's a shell. So a good product team would be uh, looking like a bunch of drawers to you, whereas a great product team would be a shell. Now, what I mean by this, which means is that when you look at a drawer, the way you interact with the drawer, you, know, you don't usually open all drawers at once, right? You open one at a time, which means that you would do one thing and then you close the drawer and you move to the next. Now, unfortunately, most product teams which are not that efficient work in the same way. They take a requirement to a particular team, they ask for the output and then they take it to the next one. Now, what that leads is it gives them a sense that their job is over. So if you treat design as the first drawer, they would get a sense that, oh, my job is over. And then engineering takes over. After engineering, the so testing takes over. Instead, a rather better functionality to work with is to think of it like a shell, where you have access to all the different teams right from the beginning. And what, what that will help you with is that you would have a very good visibility of the whole process. You would have more data points to look at right from the beginning to the end. And there's a lot of cross communication, which anyway needs to happen. So ever, ever ran into a case where, you know, you made a design and the engineering team told you that this is very difficult for us to actually bring it into port. So you might have to change something. Now, having an approach like this actually solves that kind of a problem. You don't have to go that back and forth. And you also get to take, take a look at your designs after they've gotten shipped right to the point when the customer is actually using it and you go to build the second version of it. And this slide talks about the age-old problem of designers not having a seat at the table. And this is what I'd like to talk about, that when you take a look at the whole product team in a different way, when you restructure the whole way in the, which product team works, then design can have a seat at the table, right from the beginning all the way to the end. And how that happens is that you have to make sure that you show enough value for the whole company that design is involved and it's not just fancy stuff that you're making, but instead you are actually creating the value for the user by making meaningful design decisions for the product. One of the ways to do so is to make sure that you're all looking at the app along with looking at the key metrics which you usually look at. What do I mean by that? Think of the way where you look at designs, right? So after you finish a design, how do you reference it? You open a Figma file and you take a look at the design and say, yeah, this is what we designed. But instead, think of the actual user who uses your app. They don't look at your Figma files. They actually look at the app. Same goes for your engineering team, the business team, the product teams as well. Uh, number of test cases that your code has passed has nothing to do unless the same code works well on the actual app. Same goes for product as well. Like the metrics which you see on Mixpanel or Google Analytics, they mean to a certain extent, but all of that actually has to do with the app again. So the idea here is to make sure that all of your referencing which you do happens from a product first mentality than a metrics first, than a code first, or than a Figma first mentality. Now to go ahead with the last slide of this particular piece, I'd say that we all talk about user-centric design, but we often fail to actually include the user in the design process. What does that mean? That means that a lot of time, what happens is that when you're designing something, you tend to design it in a way that you get a requirement, you start off with the requirement, and after, after you're done, you kind of feel that, hey, my work is done. So I'll just hand it off to my respective uh, engineers or product managers, right? The actual user gets involved in the process way after you've designed everything. And that is what you fundamentally should be changing by introducing the user in the design process. What it means is while you're designing something, after you've done with the first pass, probably take that whole design to a user and ask for the feedback right away. Ask them that what kind of problems you see in the design or are they able to even uh, accomplish the goals that you've defined for your user. That actually will give your design a lot of soul and meaning where you will be obsessed with the problem. So when you see something nice, you would see it coming from the user's mouth and not just numbers. If you see a problem, you would also see the same problem coming right from the user instead of just seeing a metric. So that will give your design a lot of soul and meaning. And that is what user-centric design essentially means, including the user in the design process, not after it. So what was our wins? The first win that we had was we have now built to design the whole product from a design first approach. We didn't think of design as an afterthought or just as an enabler. Design was a key, approach, key part of the whole process. The second is of course, better coverage of use cases. Remember the same example that I gave you when you made something and your engineering team told you that this wasn't possible or you thought of something which you must, must have missed. Having the whole visibility of the process in the shelf-like approach helps you with making sure all the use cases which you usually miss out, you get to cover them all. And the last is the most important one, which is, which is shipping at a higher quality, right? 
it doesn't matter unless the design gets shipped the most important thing is what the user sees not what you see on figma so next thing is of course the process you know uh, which is a major topic that i would like to talk about next now process is something that's talked about a lot like there's the double diamonds of the world there's the idea define empathize of the world but what do i mean by process and what were my goals to to actually optimize the process here at my company so my goal essentially was to create an evolving ecosystem what i mean by this is that a lot of times what you start out while you design a lot of things might seem very overwhelming if it's a product which is building from scratch now of course if you have a design system in place a lot of things become easier but if you don't things can get very overwhelming right at the beginning there's a lot of choices for colors typography the kind of design that you'd end up making towards the end the whole visual look and feel so the idea is that the your process your design process should enable designers to be not overwhelmed while they, while they start the design they should find it helpful and use it more like a tool so these are very basic examples of the same on the left you would see that there's a robust design system which you can make which will of course help you to do the same similarly the space that you see in the center is more of a templateized or a boilerplate design for example if you're designing for apps there will be a few recurring elements which you would see across multiple iterations of design and the idea is to make sure that a designer doesn't have to do the repeated work again and again whatever you see a patterns repeating optimize that process and make it into a component so that it's more easier and last is of course defining a lot of guidelines what i mean by guidelines is that a lot of times when you define certain design ideologies that you know you will follow this kind of a spacing this kind of a particular background it's very important to make sure that you document all these decisions because when someone new joins your team or even if you're working with a contractor of sorts it often helps to have all the process documented so of course like we can't talk about processes without talking about design systems and i'll not go very much into detail with it because tanisha after me will of course go through the whole thing in a much elaborate way but uh, i'd like to talk about just a few things in a design system so design system in an early stage company might be something which seems very overwhelming to begin with because there are lots of design decisions to take because you know that whatever you define is going to be used across the product so you have this sense of overwhelm which you are trying to avoid that if i make a mistake now what will it be applicable for whole of the product so maybe i'll i'll, I'll just design it right now and i'll think about design system next now that is a mentality which you have to break right at the get go and you probably get asked this question a lot from people that what is the right time to make a design system and i would say when you're starting a design a design system can be made right at that point and design system doesn't mean that you have to start it in the very uh, elaborate manner by making a component library you can just start by templatizing or documenting things which you are seeing as a repeated pattern in your designs and the second point which i'd like to talk about in design system is that you need to make sure that when you make a design system you can just start off with from a top down approach which means like instead of trying to define all of your typography color codes and every minor detail you can just start with a component which you across using multiple times in your app a good example is a bottom sheet if you are using a bottom sheet multiple times to avoid different sizes different specifications just make a component of the same and then use it and of course design systems do not end at a figma level design systems goes way beyond and it actually only starts at figma and it ends at actually making those components in code so you need to of course collaborate with your coding counterparts and make sure that the design system is getting implemented on code the next thing is called a marination period now this is something we found out about about a few months ago after multiple features that we made out of the same feature let's think of it like v1 and v2s of the same feature we started to realize a common occurrence which was that once we would make the v2 of it a lot of insights would get quite obvious to us and we would try to understand that why didn't we think of this in the first go itself and that's when we realized that it's basically just a lack of time that we were spending with understanding the problem and we were jumping on the solution way too quickly the most simple analogy for this is the word marination itself when you're trying to cook a dish like chicken the better you marinate the product the better outcome it gives you right it's the same with ideas as well and this is the main part about the same idea which is instead of jumping on the how ask yourself why you would you would be getting told by product managers a lot of times that you know this is how we're thinking of this feature we are trying to think of this in this way ask them why why is the why is the reason why why do you think about this in this way instead of jumping directly to the house and the question continues that you need to ask a lot of questions this is something i would say i've noticed across designers that 
they usually don't ask a lot of questions you need to be very inquisitive and very curious about things because if you just become an enabler then your role would get defined to that particular typecast i mean you'd get typecast in the same day and then you would not have the seat on the table which we often ask for right so few of the questions that you can ask to your product managers is something like this like you know what kind of value add is this feature doing to the product a uh, similar one is to ask what's the right time you know like let's say let's think of this way that you're building a product like zoom and the product manager pitches something like you know you need a mascot ask them if this is really a right time to build a mascot for the product is this really going to add value because a lot of time your product managers would be very creative with ideas they'll come up with very interesting things that they've seen across different apps but sometimes it's not the right time so you need to ask them about it and warn them of the same the the next one is very very important which is about asking yourself what is the core user experience and is your feature hampering that so if you if you're working with a company like uber the core user experience is to book cabs now whatever feature you add or remove should ensure that the core user experience doesn't get compromised in any way because that is what actually gets you to make more revenue right and the last is also a very important point which is to understand more about the future if you're designing an app today with a work, with a particular feature in mind you must think that what would the feature v2 and v3 look like you know what would be the way in this this feature would be scaled forward now having said that one of the most important things about working in startup is maintaining context now why is it important because unlike big companies there's very little bureaucracies and the teams are extremely lean which means that while designing the product you would see a lot of changes in the whole requirement itself and as much as we try to avoid it it will happen because that's how startups work and it becomes very difficult a lot of times for you to maintain context of all the changes that are being suggested while you start design or even after you started design so there are some neat hacks that we found out on how you can uh, maintain context better one of which is maintaining a context log so as soon as you start designing a product particular feature you would notice that you have a requirement and you have certain amount of insights you can start with but while you are designing it you would get an idea that oh this can be done differently and it's important that all of your stakeholders know about it and you also need to make sure that you document it because what often happens is once you look back at the way a product was made or a feature was made you would notice that you would start to miss out on certain information which was the middle because you know how it was defined on jira and you know what you've designed but the middle part is often gone and this helps you to maintain that and that's going to be extremely helpful to understand the design decisions you've taken and to justify them forward going forward as well now well, let's take a look at under the hood what i mean by that is what kind of things can you do inside figma which will help you to do the same in a more efficient manner so one of the things that we tried out on figma was uh, practices like adding annotations things like adding flow arrows i'll go into detail with each of them after i introduce each are uh, naming layers local components checklist and playground files so by annotations what i mean is describing different behaviors of certain design components now of course we encourage highly to make highly that people would make prototypes but a lot of times certain things are not clear from a prototype a good example would be that you're trying to show a loading animation but what's the exact duration of the animation what's the playback speed if you're showing a transition state for exact duration of the transition state you can't exactly know it from the uh, from the uh, prototype right so either you would be writing specs but a better even if you don't want to write the exact specs for the developers a good idea is to describe the behavior of your components in design and the example as you can see in the picture is to define the character limit of a particular piece of content that you're writing flow arrows are also extremely uh, useful which basically is just uh, tying up a bunch of arrows to indicate what each button takes you to a different screen now why this is helpful again you can see that prototyping helps you with this but if you want to reference something really quickly then you can't wait for a prototype to open and go through the whole flow to understand flow arrows gives you that visibility right on the figma file itself naming layers is something which is very specific to designers and some people like to do it and some people hate to do it and i might get a bit of hate for this but i don't mind it because i feel that's a very good practice now why because once you start taking your design and making components out of them or you try to think of design in a more scalable sense you'd notice that naming things are extremely helpful because as things get more and more complex if you're designing for a web flow which by web flow i mean a website flow you will see a lot of elements overlapping one after the other and a lot of these elements would be reused at different places as well as once you start making a very complex flow frame 2 1 3 4 will not be helpful for you rather naming it in a convention which will be describing what a behavior what kind of behavior it will hold will be a lot lot more helpful 
The last part is called local components. Uh, no, not the last, the third last. The local components part is basically instead of creating design systems, the idea is that instead of creating components right for the design system, idea is that when you're designing a feature, you can just create a local component in that file itself. And then later you can decide whether that feature is actually going to go into the product, if it's going to be used at other places, and then you can take that and add it to the design system. It also helps you with changing a lot of requirements on the go. So let's say that you've built a whole flow, but the PM suddenly says that, you know, let's change the color or let's change this particular thing. Instead of changing it in multiple places, if you're using a local component, it just help you to change everything in once. Uh, the second last is, of course, checklist. So what I mean by checklist is the list of same few things that you see here, along with a few more, which just helps you to make sure that all of the processes that you define for your teams are being followed rigorously and nobody misses out or take, takes a little shortcut which compromises on the design quality. And last is playground files. Uh, recently, there was a debate on Twitter about should people be uh, doing messy design or should it be very clean? Now, I am very strong believer that you should have the creativity will only come if you remove the constraints for a while. So playground files are files where you can be completely messy and you can do all the dirty work. And then while you know you are trying to add those designs to the actual developer, give them to the developer, then you can add it to a handoff file or something like that. But it's important to have that creativity without constraint. And there's the same benefits which you just talked about. Uh, it will help you in communicating these behaviors to the developers better, simplifying this extremely complicated flows through flow arrows. Uh, scalable design system is what will be extremely helpful in case you start naming the layers. It will help you to define the behavior of various components once you start describing them. And maintaining design standard is what, what we achieved with the checklist. And last uh, was about the whole uh, playground file, which was creativity without constraints. The last part, which I want to talk about, is called odd design. So just defining the process or you know ensuring certain ways to increase ownership is not enough. If you're trying to create a team which works very well with the other different verticals, you need to make some fundamental changes in the way which the org also works. One of the first thing uh, which we tried was writing a culture doc. Now, what does a culture doc mean? It can be from a company level as well. But what I mean here is that more of a design culture doc. It is basically just a list of design philosophies that you have. And the idea to write it down is to ensure that all of your teammates are with the same, are on the same page regarding to those design philosophies. Uh, for example, a good anecdote here is that when you're working at a startup, you can't really use an old file and build design on top of that because there are no teams which just work on improving something separately. Everyone works on a new feature. And if you just keep building something on top of the existing designs, your overall design standard is very difficult to improve with every iteration. So as a design philosophy at my company, we have a practice that whenever we design a flow which involves a older screen, we take that and make sure that that's also improved along with this flow. And there can be multiple things like this which you can include in your culture doc. But it's very important to make sure that this is not just your philosophy. It needs to come from your teammates as well. And it needs to be a collaborative uh, list of ideas. The second is called a product newsletter. Now that's just a fancy name for making sure that all the high level changes from your stakeholders are getting communicated. Now, especially smaller teams face this problem that when you have a very lean team, it's very easy to communicate it, right? Let's say you have a team of 10. Whatever the CEO says, everybody hears it on the meeting and they start applying the same. But once you take this team of 10 and scale it to 100, a lot of people will feel that, okay, these people are not important. I'll just communicate to the next person and hope that they will communicate to the next person. Unfortunately, that hope is often unfulfilled and the communication happens to have a lapse. A product newsletter is basically an, an, uh, it's just an email, email, for example, which has a lot of changes on a product level that the leadership believes should be there. And it's sent to everybody at the company, whoever is involved in the product. So it ensures that everybody is on the same page. Everybody is aligned on all the changes which have been suggested. And there's no lapses of communication. Now at our company, we also do a meeting every month where we discuss about all the changes which were done in the previous iteration. And we also discuss the change, uh, the impact of these changes. But I'm, I'm a very strong believer of things should be done asynchronously. So this helps you in case somebody misses out on the meeting as well. The next thing is learning us, which is a very easy and simple concept where each of your team members would be good at one particular skill, right? Let's say somebody is good at motion, someone else is good at documenting, someone else is good with visuals. And if that particular person is not there on the team, your work as a team shouldn't stop. So this just means that you take out certain time from your week and you ensure that each of your team member can teach all of your team members certain skills. It can start with a very simple thing. Like if somebody is very good at Figma, they can just teach auto layout to all of your team members. 
but in the next one they can teach more complex stuff like complex uh, component properties the next one is called 360 degree feedback this is uh, extremely helpful if you are trying to lead a team or build a team so we often we often need feedback from our seniors right we often crave for feedback from our managers but especially if you're leading a team the feedback from your teammates is way more important than what you receive from your box because they are the ones you're primarily working with on an everyday basis and it it needs to be ensured that you are doing the right things for them a one good example is to make sure that you chalk out a good growth plan for each of them right talk to your teammates and understand their strengths and weaknesses uh you might also find out that some of them might not be at the same they don't they necessarily don't see the work the, in the same way that you do some of them will be more serious about the work some of them will find it a little casual they might be at a phase of their life they don't value your job as much but it's very important to understand this difference and make sure that you incorporate that into your design process for the whole team and last is basically engaging beyond work now you need to understand this that if you just maintain a relationship with your colleagues as a colleague then it seems very artificial and synthetic they will not know you as a person and same will happen with you you will not know them as a person so it's very important to engage with them outside of work sometimes to know what things they like what kind of sports events they watch after the weekend and to just engage in more conversations which are off work it helps to create that human bond which is often very crucial while ensuring that you work in a very collaborative manner and you make sure that you understand each other well so just to recap all the three main points we talked about the first is of course you need to advocate for involving design in the product process we talked about different ways you can do that the different ways in which you can see the whole uh, product teams working you can change it to a shelf like approach the second one is ensuring that if you're optimizing a process you need to make designing easier for designers designing shouldn't be tough by any chance if you're introducing auto layout if you're introducing more complex practices you need to ensure that there should be some way in which you can automate it and your team member should find it more easier the last one is to start a lot of organized uh, organization wise in initiatives which will foster growth of your fellow teammates because of course if you're just doing the job you're not learning enough so you need to ensure that the same problem which i faced is possibly something you shouldn't face if you're working in the same team as i am So with that, I'd like to uh, finish the talk. Uh, that's pretty much it. You can find me on Twitter by this handle, and that's it. Thank you, everyone.